Okay. Good evening, James. How are you doing? I'm good, Lil. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. Um, it's pretty hey. chilly where I am, but otherwise good. It's got to hit okay. <laughs> okay, recording. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yep. Yeah. yep. So, um, yeah, I'm uh, Lil from Wedge Peace and um, this is James and i um, here to talk about a bit about the um, program and some of the uh, work in the area of STEM education that James has done. So do you want to kick off by telling me a little bit about the program you designed and like what the kids actually do as part of the program and what they learn as part of it? Sure. So um, we, I'm a maths teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, I have been a science teacher, physics, and I uh, moved to a new school uh, in 2010, 14 years ago, and I picked up the top year seven science class at that time. And so in the very first week of knowing these people, um, I gave them a whole set of science magazines to take home, and the all of our lessons in the first week were they had to come back and give me a, do a two minute speech to the class um, on all right we can edit this bit out you're on mute for some reason yeah well there we go they came back and did a two minute speech to the class Yes, they came back and did a two-minute speech, and what, lo and behold, you know, uh, three-quarters of them wanted to talk about robotics. So I said right. to them, who's interested in robotics? I mean, robots are cool. I can't deny robots are cool. Well, yeah, and in 2010, there wasn't, you know, so I, you know, went on the internet, and I went, oh, my God, I've got to get robotics, and I uh, discovered that there was a competition. Um, Macquarie University was organising it, so we made a relationship with them. That's in Sydney. And um, they sent us a robot, a little Lego robot. And um, we, I discovered that, you know, one robot's not much use. And mm -hmm. um, when you got 30 kids. But by the end of that first year in 2010, we went to the, it was called the National Championships because it was the only competition of its type with the these little Lego robots. Mm. And... Um, so that was at Macquarie Uni. And, but that group moved through. We went back the next year. I went and got uh, sponsorship from our local Rotary um, in our local town. And they, next thing you know, we had six robots. So then I could have like, you know, teams of two. And that was mm -hmm. far more constructive. And then that led to um, us forming, you know, we, I presented, I offered a year nine. 100 hour elective, which is uh, about basically it's two lessons a week or maybe sometimes three. And uh, I wrote the curriculum for that uh, robotics elective. And it was called Robotics. STEM hadn't quite taken off in 2012, like as an actual um, fully formed idea. Right. And so we were a little ahead of the curve. Um, we had a robotics elective. And uh, I wrote the curriculum in the first. The first assessment task I recall was the ethics of robotics, and um, you know that Up unit. The top. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I I was critical because I, you know, I was training students. I had learned that Australia was short seventy thousand engineers in mm -hmm. um, two thousand seven when I was involved in politics, and I went, oh my god, right. So as an educator, one of my key things that this country needs is um, is engineers. And most kids don't know what engineers are <clears throat> and uh, they have no idea what they do. Um, you know, they see pictures of vets on TV and doctors, mm. and, uh, you know, little girls want to be vets because they can, you know, save animals and um, et cetera. But no one shows them what a renewable energy engineer does. Um, mm. So they don't, you know, go around saying to themselves in year seven, I want to be a renewable energy engineer. That doesn't happen. But so come year nine, I was able to show them pictures of people who were doing robotics around the world, you know, but a lot of those programs were military based. Right. So I was able to find videos of, you know, um, robot guns, you know, 
mm. that could be set up and left behind. You could even be dropped by parachutes, set themselves up, and, you know, just shoot anything that moves, basically. Anything mm. that comes through here, the shape of a human, let's shoot it. And um, so... Uh, so that was what was available. So when you started looking... Oh, I thought, no, there for... were also stories about uh, medicine, you know, medical uh, mm -hmm. robots doing uh, medical... Um, and so it was a there was enough work there so that we could do uh you know comparison between the two. So one of the students out of that group went on. We end up that group in year nine because uh, were able to go on and win a state championship in that competition. Um, and that led then in twenty fourteen STEM became you know the, the Department of Education New South Wales decided that STEM was important and. Uh, so they create, started creating, you know, rolling out um, STEM as a not quite. It's still not quite a subject unto itself. It's certainly not a KLA, KLA, a key learning area like mathematics, science, geography. Actually, it's a. Um, it's not even called geography. Actually, geography doesn't have its own KLA. So STEM isn't even, you know, one of those. It's a. Um, it's sort of like a substrand, and mm. uh, even now. But so what do you see? Launching it, I so can I just stop you there and can you unpack a bit what you mean by like STEM? Because I would think of like you know I think of the acronym science, technology, engineering, maths. So, mm. but you're sort of using it in a different way. Like, can you tell me about? And you also said I'm conscious a lot of our uh, the people watching this or listening to this will be have done all of their high school after <laughs> STEM became prioritized. Yeah. So can you tell me a right. bit more about that sort of transition and how the department's mm. attitude towards it changed? Because um, oh. <laughs> particularly I noticed that you mentioned that 2018 was when they started to really decide STEM was important. And 2014. 2014. Oh, 2014. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Like we'd already been at a robot program for like four years by that stage, or at least three. And um, so STEM... Right now, I went to university because I was interested in physics, nuclear physics, mm -hmm. right? And and um, that's what your I, background is, yeah, sort of scientifically, yeah, I, I, yeah, nuclear physics. Yeah, my degree is in nuclear physics and um, pure mass because you have to do pure mass to study physics, study nuclear mm -hmm. physics. And uh, at University of Queensland, and um, so when I got to teach, which was seventeen years later, um. I wanted to be able to teach maths and physics, but I discovered immediately that in a part of you go, that isn't going to happen. It's not on. Right. It still hasn't happened 24 years later. Right. Really? That you, that you can teach in one school because they're different faculties. This is siloing. This is a bureaucracy, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's, you can't teach, you know, in the first school, physics is very poorly taught, generally speaking taught by people that aren't trained in physics and yeah. have no feel for it. And, I've, um, I've also got a degree in physics and I agree. <laughs> right. And it's, you know, it's really sad. Like most teachers in the seven to 10 do not want to know about physics, right? They're biology or something like that, geology. But um, so um, when you're in the Department of Education, what happens in a school is you've got a head teacher in science, you've got a head teacher in maths, and they got their own little silos, and you have to be a teacher of maths or a teacher of you know, science and physics. So I was initially six years maths teacher, and then three years science teacher, and then two years science teacher in my current school, and then I moved across to um, back to maths, and I've been there now for twelve. So I've been a uh, science, but I've never been a maths and science teacher together. Mm -hmm. But in so in 2013, 14, when they decided that STEM was, in, you know, the combining cross-faculty activities was important, the first headwind you hit was that you're running against a uh, very stable uh, headwind that is siloing in faculties. Mm -hmm. You're trying to get together science, technology, engineering, and maths now. Technology and engineering are taught in the TAS faculty. They got that, you know, engineering studies is in year 11 and 12. It's a subject. You've got um, 
you know, the other tech subjects, computing science is usually done in a TAS faculty. That TAS says, TAS is short for technical and applied sciences. It includes woodwork, metalwork, you know, um, textiles, uh, computing. Mm -hmm. And I actually rated the computing, when I wrote that curriculum for the robotics, I... I, I taught it myself the first time, but I was trying to get other teachers involved. And this is the big headwind you've got with STEM is getting cross-curricular buy-in. Mm -hmm. It's always been the key headwind. Who's going to teach it? You know, because there's so much siloing and uh, controlling our, you know, controlling resources in, in schools. So <laughs> I was uh, trying to, I had to, first year I wrote the curriculum, second year I, I got a, a different a teacher from the TAS faculty to teach the robotics elective. But by but the next year after that, STEM was in and we changed the robotics elective to a STEM elective. And so we still have a STEM elective. Um, so it's still only 100 hours. So it's um, every year it's a 9-10 combined class where we teach STEM. Um, currently being run by a science teacher. I mean, after I set it up, I was able to, um, you know, delegate to a keen younger teacher in science, and he's still running it. So wow. this is one of the problems with with STEM education is that you're trying to bring together disparate faculties. Hmm. And one of the first things I did in STEM at our school, for example, and this does bring in the militarism aspect, is that was the um, was drones. Hmm. Um, I wanted to get other people involved uh, you know, across the school and we had a strong agriculture faculty. So there was this $10,000 grant available to upskill stage six curriculum. So I made an application and got the 10K and uh, we spent a lot of it on drones. Like we bought this fleet of drones and the purpose was that we would introduce drones as a unit into primary industries and agriculture in year 11 because there was more right. flexibility in the year 11 in the year 11 curriculum so once it hits hsc it's a little more controlled so we we brought it in now when we did that in 2015 i think it was um, as a stem initiative in the school there weren't protocols for flying drones over schools and we got a, a little air drone nearby about 2 k's away there was all you know we had safety you know, we had guys from the uh, department come and to our school and um, yeah, we were part of designing the initial set of uh, protocols, but I was keen to get just to bring in tech as hard as possible. That was clearly non-military, right? Like, you know, for drones actually have great agricultural applications and, um, they haven't really taken off. I don't think as much as they could, as far as the agricultural applications go. Mm -hmm. Um, and I do think that's an education. Um, so Probably you mean you think the reason that they haven't taken off is because it's not in the curriculum? It's because it's out of teacher comfort zone. Like right. I, part of the day was I got to send people off to training. You know, I got to send to, uh, ag teachers off to training, to train how to do drones and to look into the, you know, the protocols and stuff, developing protocols for flying drones at schools. And those teachers moved on. And so mm. the training went with them. Mm. Their drones it in a box and well i actually we tried to we did bring in drones at one stage into our stem curriculum which is now well developed our stem curriculum after like eight ten years we did bring drones in for a fair while there because they're so much fun you know mm. just little drones flying around you buy these little ones for like 20 bucks that kids build and then they have to you know fly them around and you can they but most of them they're remote controlled you know they're not actual robots they're remote controlled that's not the same thing they're not mm. autonomous mm -hmm. um so, but we end up have withdrawing drones from our STEM curriculum because the main application turned out to be military. You know, the, yeah. the military was very keen on, on um, drone, you know, training in drones and all the programs and the, all the uh, the materials that were coming through were um, connected to the military. Now, way mm -hmm. at the very start of STEM, New South Wales at the very start. Well, I'm talking 2013, big conference. I remember meeting um, Eddie Wu at uh, the first STEM conference down in Sydney. He mm -hmm. was a math teacher. At, yeah. Uh, very book time. 
Um, but he was just showing up to the STEM comp- uh, STEM thing. He wasn't a speaker. Now he right now he's the main speaker. Mm. Um, uh, but we were there to do the launching of STEM as an idea. You know, as in in um, in the department, I went to a lot of STEM development uh, days and such like at the very start. We and you know consequently got STEM up as a uh, subject in our school. And I remember the first one of the the first actually the second meeting. This guy from um, who was teaching engineering studies year eleven from the TAS faculty stamped into the room with his head teacher and shouted at us, "You're taking my job!" Right. And then turned around and stamped out. Now <clears throat> we didn't take his job. Right? <laughs> engineering study, engineering study still runs, and so does right. STEM elective. Right. Right. But that was sort of headwinds when you're trying to deal with these institutional structures that you know reach back like old tree roots into the 1960s yeah um so though a lot of those people have moved on but tr- at the very start of stem at those conferences there was a certain school in the hunter valley that um i went to that school did a work did some time there uh, you did a development day and all the material that was handed out had a little badge on the top of it. And that badge was Australian um, Ministry of Defence Materials, spelled mm-hmm. with an ELS, like some sort of French spelling, right? <laughs> yeah. There was a this ministry was How associated with the defence, but they were well, they were paying for the development th- through those channels of uh, that angle of STEM. Now we. Because oh, I was running STEM in my school, I steered away from it immediately. And I actually told our teachers that if you, know, if you want to do, you know, military-related STEM, great, you do it, but I'm not doing it. And um, like I said, when I designed the uh, robotics team, we, um, you know, we <clears throat> focused on the non-military applications mm-hmm. from that first team, from that first stage yeah. team. Well, and you had the whole ethics component, we, right? Which is like, yeah, yeah, that's right. We said so from that and, team, and that's that's unusual, as I understand, in a lot of these STEM programs to actually, absolutely. you know, specifically talk and about still, the ethical support, dimension. Yeah. That's right, absolutely. From there, we sent a girl through um, computer science and physics, to the UNSW, and she is now a, a senior research. Uh, engine you're on mute again okay yeah sorry yeah she's I, sorry so yeah. she's a yeah patchy so internet in the country eh? <laughs> so she's a senior yeah. research but something she's a research a senior research engineer with a company uh-huh. called earth orbit robotics so she's been able to chart herself a career into in um you know physics engineering into space uh you know they're an award-winning company a space um <clears throat> industry right and sidestepped you know um sidestep involvement in military applications mm-hmm. the, the takeover of the mil of uh, the, the military infiltration of the stem system for example there was when i started i went to say you know i went to some development days on there was a uh, competition where you designed little race cars like mm-hmm. formula one called f1 in schools mm-hmm. and that the mob that were running that have morphed into other uh, other styles, and one of their styles they've morphed into now is a oh. underwater drone competition for like year ten students. So mm-hmm. they, you know, they have to build drones that can r- drive around in pools, mm-hmm. right, or on the bottom of pools. Now it's clearly stated in the um, yeah. in the materials uh, at, when you investigate that um competition that structure 
that reset of resources that's clearly stated that this is about training a new set of submariners for the AUKUS program. Now, that right. is written in white, you know. Oh, yeah, the great new industry in Australia. We need all these new submariners. Right. And bam, they came up with a, you know, with a, and, and you know, it's very easy to get funding to run these things. Mm-hmm. When you apply, right now, I need money for my robotics program because mm-hmm. the state peel back, um, peel back funding, you know, uh, mm-hmm. at the end of term one this year. So now I've got to go back to the Rotary and ask, put my hand out, ask for some money because, you know, running a robotics program is not cheap. I go, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, not it, not in a not in a regional low socioeconomic area where kids don't have laptops. You know, so mm-hmm. these kids have got a laptop. No, I don't mm-hmm. have a laptop. You know, most of my team do not have laptops. Mm-hmm. They they can become download programs like the woman I just mentioned. Mm-hmm. But you know, um, what is evenly distributed is talent. In my experience, mm-hmm. twenty five years teaching. What's not evenly distributed is opportunity. Mm-hmm. So that is a uh, that is a, a situation into which you know military funders can can easily move. You know, put mm. cash on the table. And there's you know hungry hands reaching out for it. Mm-hmm. And so, when you're looking around for funding, do you find oh, it's well, difficult to avoid defence money? Like, uh, no, I don't because. Where there's a will, there's a way. There you go. Like, yeah, like I, uh, I was at one school for three years where I the principal wouldn't let me get sponsors, so I couldn't run a chess competition. Mm-hmm. I couldn't run the bridge building competition. Mm-hmm. I couldn't run. Yeah, the robotics was off the table. I didn't it hadn't even come up with that idea at that stage. Mm. But um, when I run a bridge building competition, I go to my local a local engineering firm in a local town that builds houses and what whatnot. And get sponsorship. So mm-hmm. you know, you, when you win our local competition, you can win like five hundred bucks. That's better than the state one. See, that's because that's the sort of because we go. Oh, well, you know, I offer him a photo in the paper, mm-hmm. and an ad for a, in a, a local paper is worth like seven hundred bucks. And mm-hmm. this is, you know, this guy gets to come out and judge the bridges when they get broken, and the chess comp. I got a le- engine. I got a legal company to throw on a hundred bucks um, for the. For the to win the chess comp next, you know, these kids lining up to play chess for weeks on end, mm. and they love, um, they certainly loved a hundred bucks. Um, <laughs> so but in a low socioeconomic area, you know, to put a hundred bucks on the table for a competition, you're going to get uh, take up. Mm. So yeah, so when I got to the current school, the teacher, the principal was much more supportive, and I was easily able to go out and get support. And Rotary certainly was our biggest supporter. And when we go to comps, we have a shirt. We put their little logo on our shirt, for example. But right now, our, one of our major supporters is Engineers Australia, and they have been for a number of years. Yeah, yeah man. We, we have their logo on our shirt, yeah, and we have had for at least two versions of that shirt mm. um, because they recognise that you know we deliver in a regional school to low socioeconomic area, and we've had to refine the competition. We change competitions. Because the one that we started in, when you evolve it to a higher level, it's uh, got military funding in the background. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so um, that wasn't the reason we changed it. The reason we changed was because when you get to a top level of it, um, it costs $6,000, you know, to participate in. And right. so I can't put my hand out now for $6,000. You know, we were up until recently, we were running robots that cost $25. Yeah. You know, uh, and that was what we would go. We were saying we're doing um, uh, easily accessible robotics. You know, we yeah. come up against tech where their robots are worth many thousands of dollars from private schools. But we were running an equity program of anyone can do it, you know, 25 yeah. bucks or. So, so, and do you feel like, you know, like on that equity point, like when you've had access to sort of these better funded uh versions of this do you feel like the learning like does it age you as a teacher or can you do just as much you know you hit all the learning outcomes with the 25 dollar robot like like well, what's the um, the difference in the kind of like experience for the students and for you as the educator well in fact the, the difference in the competitions was stark like um when i started in the new comp 
I didn't know the rules, uh, and um, it was a game of soccer. You know, it's called Robo Cup. And in my second year, uh, they needed volunteers, and one of the jobs I got as a volunteer teacher, you know, on the days of the competition, was to keep the adults out of the preparation room. Right. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so if you look in there, there's only so yeah, no, I do my job generally speaking, and uh, there were no adults in there. Whereas <laughs> in the app that we came from that cost six thousand dollars, you look out to the next bay, you know, there's like thirty teams in the in the um prep preparation room, and you look across there and there's all these men on the tools, mm. teachers, parents, fathers, you know, mm. on the tools. They're the ones with the tools in their hand and the kids are over at the vending machine. <laughs> you know, or, you know, somewhere else lined up at the canteen and that you know absolutely no i um this the competition that where the kit where there's no adults allowed in the prep room that suddenly that you know the, we train for that we train yeah. you know or, or that's you know that's why i need individual laptops because the kids need to be completely autonomous they need to be able to walk into that room with their own laptop and so i need to get my hands on laptops and the PNC paid for my last two laptops that I supplied to the um, to the uh, because we had we did have some other laptops that broke down after five years, and so I got two more good ones um, from the PNC. Now this time around they got no money, and so I've got to go to we're going to get some second hand ones, and I'm going to get the software packages for pay. I'm going to go to Rotary and ask for that money. Hmm. But I've also got another sponsor, which is an engineering firm in the town, a major engineering firm that build does big steel mat fabricating. And they're stoked, you know. Um, they they come. They have sent their men into the school and shouted, "Ooh, you know!" They already offered a girl a cadetship in year ten, but she wants to become a doctor. Mm -hmm. um, so turn them down. Um, so, uh, but I'm so I'm hearing that the learning outcomes are not a thousand times better when the robot is a thousand times more expensive. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No, no. It's the more independent your program is, such as the students have to do the work. The the learning is is actually escalated as soon as it becomes more. The more responsibility you have to take, then the greater the learning out, out, outcomes. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, no, this is respected. Um, we have delivered many of our students from our robotics program have gone on to top universities. Um, the Rover Cup comp used to be held at UNSW, and we start a relationship with them. And uh, we have had, you know, at least six uh, uh, four engineering students. There's a, a twenty, a forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollar over time is escalated scholarship, so the kids from regional areas can go in to stay at their uh, accommodation. Mm. It's that that amount of money covers their staying at the university. And so we, our robotics team, competition in the last six years has delivered at least six kids to that. Uh, those scholarships so that they can go to, and most of them have chosen UNSW. Mm -hmm. I got one in, um, we had one uh, alumni at Newcastle and one alumni went to Sydney and now she is a uh, ticketed biomedical engineer. She was a state champion in our program in year 10 in about 2016, 2017. She was Gen 2. Cool. Um, now we have a range of students that have gone on to um you know, engineering outcomes, non-military engineering outcomes. Mm. Um, you know, I've mentioned two right there, space. We have another girl who's uh, picked up the scholarship, UNSW, and she's an environmental engineer. Mm. Um, in fact, we have two of them. Um, and do you, uh, think, another... do you think that, uh, so when you're saying, like, you know, you've got a lot of these students that have been through your program who have gone on to become engineers but not in the military sphere, um, do you think that would be different if we were talking about, you know, one of these programs that's, you know, I know that there's one in the Hunter Valley where they actually like tour a Lockheed Martin lab as part of it. Do you think that that has an effect on them? It certainly does. It has. Yes. I mean, I'm currently organising a, uh, a um, well, I did back then too in 2011 and onwards. Uh, I've always been trained. I've, been, I've got training in gifted and talented in my education, um, your degrees, my um, master's education, school leadership and gifted and talented. 
And the one of the things I learned in the gifted and talented uh, subjects was that one of the ways that children uh, develop their adult identity is through pictures. They don't, they don't, you know, when they picture themselves who they are when they're going to be 25, it's or when they make that, start forming that identity in their head, it's not got numbers and words in it. It's got pictures. Mm. So mm. you want to influence that. You take them to the steps of, and, and that, that girl I said did finish the medical engineering only like this year, and she's coming to our girls in STEM breakfast, incidentally, because we run one, we run our girls in STEM breakfast at the end of November each year for year mm -hmm. sixes and fives. Um, she's coming uh, to that. Now she's finished a degree, mm. but she was at that year eight um, excursion on the steps of Sydney university taking mm. selfies, you know, so she, I could probably get a photo of her there as a year eight student in our yeah. robotics team. She was at that time. And then again, graduating as a medical engineer. Mm. Now, uh, yeah, I, this is the joy of being a teacher. You have yeah. to go and scratch, scratch for your money, but to have two photos like that, you know, um, that is joyous. Yeah. Um, because neither of her parents have got university degrees, mm. um, and um, you know they're not from wealthy backgrounds. No mm. way. But that child has been able to picture herself in that place. Now you take that and change that out to a tank manufacturer. Mm. You will, you know, the child goes on to tank manufacturing. You, you put them into a submarine drone competition rather than a soccer competition, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, next thing you know, they're submariners, mm -hmm. right? And they start believing that nuclear submarines are good for Australia mm -hmm. because that's what they keep getting told. That's the picture they painted of their own identity. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I do believe that it's very important about what pictures you put in an adolescent's mind, you know, mm. when you get them taking a selfie, you know, um, is it with military jets in the background mm. or is it with, you know, the, you know, the halls of learning at a university, you know, Sydney mm. University steps. So they, they're just inspired by the entire idea of learning because they don't even know what engineering is when they're in your age, but they certainly know what the military is. Mm. And, um, and the military know this. They know that they've got to capture kids before year 10. That's right. understood. They know that. that, that, that that's, they've got to get in their faces before year 10 or else they'll lose them. Well, me, I tell all the kids that I train through uh, STEM and, in, and robotics, you can make your choices when you're an adult. Right? Mm. But the, until then, you're a child and then you need to you know, remain innocent and, and be able to identify, a, you know, develop your identity with uh you know independently without mm. external without external now, taking them to university i'm sure that might be an external influence but it's really just a pathway to myriad pathways mm. you know um i was studied when i came out of physics i was the mo the biggest employer was the military yeah mm. lots of jobs you know and work for us yeah mm. um well paid jobs too what's that sorry well-paid jobs too pays a lot better than teaching. <laughs> oh, well, those golden that, handcuffs. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, however, I can assure you that joy of watching that girl, you know, taking her down to that university in year eight, and then seeing her send me the photographs of her graduating as a medical engineer. You, you know what? Yeah. What? You know. <laughs> Yeah, no, nah. I don't, you know, okay, I get, you know, year nine boys, bottom year nine, yeah, they want to spit on you, they want to treat you with disrespect, but when you have those experiences as a teacher, then you understand the the, the joy that's available. Um, so as far as development of STEM, it's completely doable. It, and, and when you, it's also critical that you go out and engage with the community. Mm. You know, I mean, that's what I mean. By, oh, well, Engineers Australia, that uh, key sponsor, you know, um, and the 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 person who's their community liaison officer comes out to the competition because she knows she's going to meet us, you know, because mm. we have three or four teams there, and she comes and shakes their hands, gets the photos, and um, you know, so she comes and and 
hands out awards at the uh, at the Robo Cup State Championships in Sydney, and um, we so we have this engagement, you know, so with our local engineering firms, with the Rotary, which is a local community group, and they've actually come to us and say, "You guys need more money, or what?" You know, and I said, "Yeah, right." We, oh no, that's what that's the word. Somebody passed the word through. You know, right? We want to get involved again because we did drop off Rody for a little while there because um, I can't remember why to tell the truth, but um, <laughs> I think it's because we didn't need the money, you know, um, because you know the school was fairly wealthy and we were well supported once we started winning state championships and sending you know scholarships for kids in uni. Um, we got a lot more support from the, from the. Um, and we still have excellent support, except the school just, you know, changing funding arrangements at schools. So, yes, yeah, so I will be going. Rotary's come back to us and said, you know, yeah, we're in for it more. So um, next version of the shirt will probably have Engineers Australia, Rotary and our local engineering firm. <laughs> yeah. 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 So The network widens. What's that, sorry? The network widens. Oh, well, that's it. It's, it's, it's national. It's Rotary, as I suppose, international, but but it's, it's Rotary is more community, uh, mm. um, and and then it's local. Like those guys want our kids. Yeah, the, the engine, local engineering firm wants our kids. Mm. You know, come work for us. We'll give you a cadetship. You know, pay all the way through university. But the kids don't want to stay in this little country town. They mm. want the sixty dollars scholarship to go to big city. Mm. Yeah, and I don't blame them. Mm. Um, it's you know very exciting down. You know when you like. We sent a, a girl to UNSW. She cracked their in their um, university Rainbow Cup team, and she just got back from Netherlands, being over there for like three weeks, um, representing UNSW in the international Rainbow Cup mm. competition. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's the big wide world out there. You know, mm. for um, you know, on our. Yeah, they've all got stories like that to tell a lot of mm. our um, alumni from the program. Mm. Yeah. So I just want to come back to the part that you, where you were talking about how you teach the ethics of it or the ethical dimension of it because I think that's something that makes a lot of teachers that I've spoken to across the course of this campaign are quite nervous about teaching contentious material or teaching about things that are seen as controversial. So, like, how did you approach that? And, like, did you find that challenging? Did you feel like you got any uh, pushback from from parents or from the department? Well, or? well the first thing, first element is it does help to have had a life before, not just go school, university, school, right? Yeah. Now, I did 17 years between school or university and back to school. Mm -hmm. So I've got a little bit of experience in the outside world. Mm -hmm. That does help, right? Because it means that you understand you're in a bureaucracy. Just because they say something doesn't mean you have to do it. Like, yeah. jump, you'll jump when, I tell, when, I, when I tell you, I'm going, no, I won't. You know, I, I want this money, right? I want this money. I want to run this robotics competition, this robotics oh. team, because the children want it. So when I stare them down, I go, the students want this. And then they all look at each other and go, oh, yeah, that's right, the students. Mm. And when you ever <laughs> say, let's see, this is the difference about our robotics program. It's always been student-driven. I only found out about it. It only came because the students wanted it. And do they love it? They love it. Mm. They just want to do it. They just love it. The whole idea, like they've got year nine boys that are not very, you know, they've got great programming skills. Not very good social skills. You know, when you hit with the maths and programming stick, you do tend to sometimes get shortchanged on some of the other, you know, life skills. And everybody who's been in a university mathematics faculty should know what I'm talking about. <laughs> mm, yeah, no, no, that's right. But there's a place for them. And even those kids, I tell them, look, I tell my advanced maths year nine class, I said, look, only my experience is only 15% of the people that hit with the maths stick. Hmm. Only half of them have got the, you know, the tenacity to turn those that talent into skills, and we and we need every single one of them to run hmm. this comp society. We need every one of them to to that can combine that talent and that tenacity to make the skills to go forward and run this show. Those my sons are renewable energy engineers. 
you know, that this, this transition has got to be built by somebody. Mm. And, and there's a lot of jobs. There's a lot of, you know, work to be done. Mm. Uh, uh, so I, uh, when we're dealing, the, the program is driven by the children. So when I'm ever dealing, and, and everyone can see this, you know, when they come and meet our children, that's why Engineers Australia come, because mm. they come and meet our kids and they go, oh, my God, we couldn't go to the New South Wales, sorry, the Newcastle Regional Comp this week or to last week because we weren't ready. We wanted to step up to complex robots this year, a little bit more mm. expensive than $5. Yeah. About, about 250 you know, right? But, yeah, the kids said, oh, look, we want to work a robot. I was going, get ready. This is much harder. Uh, so they weren't ready. Mm-hmm. And so said, no, nope, you're not going. This game of soccer, you can't see the ball. Mm. You can't. So the guy that's running the comp down there, doctor, you know, in the engineering faculty at Newcastle, sends me back at him, oh, I was looking so much forward to refereeing your team. And what referee ever wants to look forward to refereeing teams? <laughs> well, he, <laughs> he knows our kids. Mm. These kids want it. They go there. They have fun. It's fun. So, you know, it's not hard. To, if there's really an edge, if you really deal, this is how you know whether you're dealing with an educator or not. Because mm. you know? if you it mean it to you in both the children, and all I have to do is bring a couple of them down. If I need a teacher to do something for me, or a deputy or a principal, I send the children. <laughs> the computers, will you? You know, no, they're sick of me asking for stuff. You go down there and ask for them. We'll tell them we need three laptops. You know what's going <laughs> to Those laptops are coming. You know, because that's just what a principal ever wants to see. They don't want to spend all their time dealing with troubled, troubled children who need to be suspended or whatever. And then suddenly this, you know, joyous youngster turns up and wants to, you know, needs a laptop because their parents are poor, but they're loaded with talent. And, you know, any teacher worth his salt who should, should stay in the business, they get melted by that sort of thing. Mm. They just go, oh, God, how do we do this now? So, yeah, no, the the headwinds fall away as soon as if your program is student run, Mm. if it's if it's student oriented, what do you Mm. want? Yeah, they came to me this year and said, can we step up, please? Can we go to the harder ones? I'm going, oh, God. (laughs) Oh, I said, it might take two seasons, children. This is you are really wanting to step up here. Mm-hmm. Well, they probably will make the state championships in four weeks. But they want to, right? They want to. Well, that's up. it. I, I look at them and said, "You sure? They're not there to bludge." No, no, and they come. But we do it after school, like we do. Oh, you do, do it, it after? school. It's not even in school time. It's in a country school, like in the, up until this year, I was doing it lunch times, and we just couldn't make headway. That's why we use simple yeah. robots. But now, but now we do it after school, two afternoons a week, from mm-hmm. three thirty to five, and the parents pick them up. You know, parents, yeah, they just organise it, you know, mm. um, because the students want it. Mm. And um, so, you know, and like I'll put on two Sunday workshops between here and the um, here and the state championships. I have to give up two of my Sundays mm. because it just takes so long to build and program robots. Anyone who's known anything about it knows this is true. Mm. It takes time. And, um, you know, the, you put on an extra, you know, sensor, it's an exponential growth in complexity. And uh, so, you know, the next thing you know, the kids want four new senses. I want God. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, so, yeah, so we're doing a lot of our work, uh, you know, out of school hours. Um, but mm. and so obviously it does only certain teachers are in a place, like my kids have finished uni and I have the wherewithal to provide, to offer that. In mm. the past, I did, it in, I did it during school time. And that's what having the... Subjects was valuable. Uh, currently, mm. the STEM has taken a slightly different turn at our school. We have a whole lot of drones sitting in cupboards mm. because the, the minute you take drones out, all of the stuff that's on the internet about you know school-based drone programs, you look behind them and they're like you said, you know, funded by some military aircraft company. And mm. um, so yeah. we've actually so- taken drones out of our curriculum for STEM. We've got a whole stack mm. of them on the shelf in the cupboard. But we've taken them out because you just there's nowhere to turn uh, yeah. without getting involved. And the, the colleague that's taken over the STEM program from me, I've been able to you know pass it on. He uh, comes from the same perspective on this matter. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, all 
my, all of these people have been involved in STEM are the same. Um, you know, they, uh, they're still children. They're teenagers, but they're still children and they deserve innocence. They mm. deserve um, to be able to develop their intellect, their capacities without being um, headhunted mm. uh, so that they can then choose who they are. You know, mm. we offer them opportunity to choose who they are because based on their skills and talents um, and their motivation, like if, I, I, I spoke to a girl today, pulled her out of class and said, look, four weeks for state championships. If you don't step up here, you've got to go and work out how to find that ball because if you can't find the ball, I'm can- cancelling this whole year. Mm. Um, we can just putter along and be preparing for next year because you can't play soccer if you can't find the ball. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm just going. And so she's gone and I said, you know where to get the information. You've got to go to that teacher. You've got to hassle him at lunchtime to help you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, so I expect that that teacher got hassled today. <laughs> that would, has come second in the state, right, and has come second in the country um, mm-hmm. and still interested, year nine girl, still interested in going good this year. So, but I put the pressure on. I said, this is an engineering operation. There's deadlines. Mm. Yeah, you've got to use It's just not some joke. We are not going. If you can't find a ball, there's no state championships. I'm not mm. driving to Sydney, you know. <laughs> no. Find yeah. the ball. What's the thing? <laughs> Duh. So, yeah, no, it's a proper – I said, well, this is what this is real life we're talking about. Mm. You know, we can get you a $60,000 scholarship, but not if you can't even find a ball when you want to play a game of soccer with a robot. No, I'm sorry. I won't <laughs> play. So, you know, they quickly realise that it's real, you know. Um, they want me to bend over backwards on Sundays, give up two Sundays. Then I want them to, you know, um, it's a two-way street, you know. Yeah. So that's what every team is. You know? mm-hmm. it's, um, everyone's got their role. And if someone's not pulling their bloody weight, someone, I'm the captain, i got to, you know, put my, well, I'm actually the coach. I put mm-hmm. my boot up their bum and tell them, you know, mm-hmm. hey, we need you to lift now. Mm-hmm. So given that there's like, I'm hearing, you know, across what you've said, like a few things that have come up are like, there's definitely this, hunger among the students for these types of programs like they're really keen on them and the uptake is really good Mm. there's a lack of resourcing is a problem Mm. and Mm. then um and then you've also got this sort of push and this refocus of the curriculum at a at a more policy level and a departmental level around stem and the importance of stem as a sort of area of work so what do you think are the broader implications of all this defence money and this, these weapons companies sort of finding their way into education spaces through this, like, STEM, this push for STEM and this sort of sense of urgency for STEM and this perception that there's no other way to get the money? Like, what do you see as, as where does that go? Thank, thanks for that detailed question, but I want to go back to the first element of it, which reminded me of something that I hadn't mentioned. Yeah. There was a change in the stage four, year seven and eight uh, TAS syllabus, technical and applied science syllabus, which demanded that they had delivered 50 hours of coding. That's like a semester, two mm. terms of coding. Now, that freaked them out because they had – Never had to do that before. It was specialised computing teachers in year nine and ten, um, and next thing you know, they all had to learn how to deliver this sort of stuff, right? So that really freaked them all out. So the department issued this dry as you know, boring as bad shit book. You know, here, do this, <laughs> and because we were already up and running, this is like twenty seventeen or something. Because we were already up and running with robotics in our school, mm. we just. You know, with the help of some very ta- talented, talented designer, head teacher of TAS, uh, we developed this $20 robot such that every kid could build a robot and learn how to code it as to deliver the 50 hours of coding. Mm-hmm. But with Mint, we also delivered basics of electronics, soldering skills, you know, screw using screws and making, mm-hmm. you know, putting wheels on. Why does it run straight? Well, your wheels aren't straight, do you know, they can't, um, yeah. you know. Lots of basic engineering skills um, were able to be delivered while inside of that. So the department changed 
the the syllabus the TAS, and that led gave us the opportunity to bring into classrooms the robotics program. But it turned out the biggest issue was the teachers were freaking out. Like some, there were I did witness a woman in tears because it was so challenging to her as a teacher to have to deliver this. You know, after being a teacher for thirty years um, in home economics, to have to del- suddenly deliver robotics was such a challenge to her. Mm. She tried, but um, she tried, but uh, you know. And in the end, we've had to scale that back because of you know how challenging it was for so many teachers. So then I go on to the the militarism, in, you know, infiltration into um, education. You don't need to do it, right? Now, if kids want to do militarism, they can choose to join the cadets. Right, because those, those, that's available in just about every school hmm. when in every town. You can join the cadets. If you're that keen on military, you know, join, join the military, great, do it. You know, the mil- you know, but that's a choice that a teenager that a, you know, has to make as far as forming their identity, not have it, in, not have it buried in the background of their syllabus. Like, oh, we're going to do this you know, competition where we design underwater submarines and then next thing you know they go online they go to the comp and guess who's there you know the navy um mm. um yeah so that that you you know it, it you can exist without that absolutely you can mm. you know you can get the money from other sources you can choose an equity program where you don't go the you know when we come up against expense you know rich private schools where the robots were two thousand dollars a pop, and they beat us all the time, right? <laughs> Virtually never beat them because they have tutors that come to their program. It costs five hundred dollars a head to join their program at their school, mm-hmm. you know. And every step of the way, they have to pay and pay. Um, you know, we don't even really yeah. measure ourselves by that. We like to beat them when we can. I remember those girls in year ten, the one that became a medical engineer. It, she beat uh, a cr- team from Cranbrook um, in the state final. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, like little school, two girls from little school up in the bush um, managed to knock off a team from Cranbrook. Um, the girls didn't even know. They didn't know what Cranbrook was. Mm. They had no idea. Yeah. And um, So I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> Yes, and the Cranbrook teacher knew too. <laughs> and there, there were celebrations all around when these two girls, you know, um, won this comp. And, uh, you know, lots of people, there's a lot of people watching, um, came from all around the room to see it. And it was at UNSW, as I recall, in their great hall. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me see. Yeah, one of them became a primary school teacher and the other one a medical engineer. Mm. Yep, so... No, it's completely doable. You can yeah. do it. It depends on the it depends on the will of the children and the uh, the commitment. It does take a lot of commitment of the of the teachers. Um, some teachers, yeah, mm. yeah, and I think that is one of the key elements. You know, is the commitment. Um, the I think it's commitment. Yeah, but it's mm. you know for me it's a love of learning. You know, um, and for me, because I'm trained in physics and maths, it's a love of engineering learning to watch them do this crazy shit. And go, what? <laughs> like, robotics is so hard. Like, when I'm hunting robot, you know, future robot students, I go to year, the top year eight math students. Mm-hmm. And I go and speak to them and say, consider this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reason I do that is because it, it, robotics requires that sort of tenacity, uh, mm-hmm. problem-solving tenacity. And kids that have got them intellectual wherewithal can be calm, can put in, you know, persistence to crack a annoying as hell problem. And as soon as you fix that one, you just arrive yourself at the next hurdle. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's uh, a that's a beautiful play, way to and place to sort of like close off this part of the conversation. But uh, I'll just end with this is a question I ask everyone I interview. Uh Speaking of tenacity and uh, commitment and persistence, I know you've uh, been involved in your fair share of um, anti-militarist organising outside of your professional life. So what's your activist origin story? How did you sort of come come to decide that that was necessary as a thing to do with your time? Oh, my God. 
I studied nuclear physics at university. I went to University of Queensland in 1980. Mm-hmm. And I walked out of my degree in 1984. Um, I had a year off and went overseas. Um, but uh, my three-year degree, I didn't get my degree because the people that wanted to hire me were not the people that I wanted to work for. Um, and I, the, the reason this was true was because I discovered that Nuclear power produces plutonium Mm -hmm. and that there was no way to uh, store it, no way to manage it, no way to reprocess it, you know, to reduce it. Like reprocessing plutonium, when they say they're going to reprocess um, spent rods, what they're doing is making more plutonium, right? And I Mm -hmm. knew that plutonium is seriously toxic shit. And it's around forever, basically, as far as our species goes. And I could not believe that my colleagues, these elders of the physics community, willfully made this stuff because it didn't exist before humans made it in nuclear reactors. It did mm. not exist in the universe that we know of. The highest naturally occurring, the uh, heaviest naturally occurring element is uranium. And plutonium is heavier than that because you bombard uranium with neutrons to... to to uh, get the reaction and you end up with plutonium as one of your um i think it's one percent of your um of the finished you know uh, the fuel rods after the reaction I, i'm just going hold on you people made this stuff and you have no idea how to manage it zero mm. i'm going it's going to be forever now some people are talking about you know measuring the the new thing called the Anthropocene by the first appearance of plutonium in the biosphere, Mm. you know, tree rings and ice cores and shit like that. And it's saying 1954 when there were so many atmospheric tests um, and plutonium began to exist on the surface of the earth. Well, the people that made that, they know, how dangerous it is. We're not just talking about cancers. Cancers are one of the results of mutation caused by the ionizing radiation released from plutonium. Some of the other isotopes, there's four and a half percent of nuclear waste is these radioactive isotopes, but their life, their 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 half lives are less. You know, I think cesium's like thirty five years. So most of the half the cesium or more that was released in Chernobyl is already broken down. Um, others are like 110 days and things like that. But this thing, this stuff is 24,000 years. It's not just us. It's every species that's likely to inhabit this planet has to deal with this stuff that we made in these two generations that physicists made in these two generations on this planet and then released, mm. ne- negligently released, knowing they had no way of controlling me, I'm saying this going, what? Who are you people? I mean, where is your heart? Where is your soul? Mm. And so now I ran away from them as fast as I could go. And I wanted to, I left university and I sought to be a landed peasant. That's what I, when I leveled out my degree in nuclear physics, and I actually got to be a landed peasant 17 years later <laughs> before, I realized, mm, before I realized that being a peasant meant that I was poor. Now, I'd, I'd always been poor, I didn't care, but then, but I had children, mm. and I wasn't prepared to inflict my dogma upon them. And I'd always planned to become a maths teacher um, along the way at some stage, so yeah. I did become a maths teacher. Um, so my children have to be poor. But, mm. um, yes, I was in the same land that I achieved when I, you know, <laughs> achieved landed peasantry, but I'm not <laughs> poor anymore. Yeah. Um, so, um, but my first action was I couldn't believe they were sailing nuclear armed warships. The U.S. nuclear armed warships were sailing into the middle of Sydney, into the middle of Brisbane, and tying up for like a week while the sailors partied in town. Right. And, and I'm just going, hold on, don't you people understand this risky? You know, what are you doing? You mm-hmm. know, nuclear weapons in the middle of the city, you know, ships have fires. You know? mm. And I don't trust these 
physicists quite as much as, you know, anyway, you say physicists, <laughs> people can't spell it and they think, oh, we better trust these people. I know what they're doing. <laughs> uh, well, since I discovered that they don't know what they're doing, that they mm. made the nasty shit that they don't know how to control or store, I don't know no, no, what they're doing at all. And mm. we don't want those nuclear weapons parked. So I, my first action was um, paddling a surfboard out to the side of a nuclear armed warship that was tying up as a dock and holding up a poster that said, Australia declares peace on the world. <laughs> and I was got, got blasted from the deck with a uh, water hose. It wasn't a water can. It was just a you know, firefighting hose. But right. it but it looked very good on TV when they put it on TV. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So then I was locked in. I, you know, my first, so my first campaign until the Hawke government stopped nuclear arm visits, warship visits to cities for five years, just let us, you know, it was a classic example of just, you know, calm the waters and let the, you know, let the focus of the activists change mm. and they'll all forget about it. <clears throat> well, I haven't forgot about it. And I am this weekend going to speak at a Hiroshima Day rally about AUKUS, mm. you know, to put the press about these nuclear weapons and nuclear power doesn't stop. And mm. there's good reasons for that, which are not, you know, I won't go into here and now. But yeah, no, my first campaign, my first action was nuclear armed warships in the Brisbane River. Yeah. Mm. Most people, most people say they signed a petition. That's a pretty sick first action. Yeah, no, I remember ring up. I, I heard about it on the on the university radio station Triple Z. I was, mm. you know, at home, and I heard the guy say, "Oh yeah, so we're going out to do this action, right? <clears throat> and uh, if you've got a boat, get in touch because they were called Brisbane Peace and Environment Fleet, right? Uh, and I went, oh yeah. So I rang the number they gave, and the guy goes, oh yeah, have you got a boat? I went. Sort of. He said, well, how big is it? And I said, oh, six foot six. He said, what? I said, it's a surfboard. Oh, okay. Well, bring it along. So I turned up at 8 a.m. after driving cabs all night, and there was no one there. No, and I watched the warship come in and turn around, and before it tied up, one other guy turned up with his posters, and he had a boarder too, so we paddled out together and got picked off. <laughs> and, uh, but it, um, Turns out that the Peace and Environment Fleet had been picked off much earlier, way up the river, and we never even saw them. Um, right. So the cops had already grabbed them. This was J.B. Olkie Peterson time with the special. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, they all, yeah, so they didn't even get close to, to the wharf. <laughs> but but, but so right. I was there for three hours, and somebody came, t- turned up. And, so there was two of us. But I do remember the, um, the, uh, the magistrate's court. The magistrate actually asked me about it. He said, so you're somehow, you know, my solicitor who did free, ah, that was a classic solicitor, that guy. Uh, He was a civil um, liberties, uh, president of the Queensland Civil Liberties Council under Joe. Yeah, right. Tough job under Joe. Oh, it was. Yeah, no, he was a great, uh, you know, he was a very, you know, I suppose he was a great Queenslander. He really was. And it was my honour to have ever had anything to do with him. But I, um, he did tell the magistrate that I was uh, studying, had studied nuclear physics. And the magistrate asked him, he said, well, what's your opinion? And I said, well, the risk is not zero, sir. You know, and I, they, they shouldn't happen. And in the end, it didn't happen. They moved him from the centre of the city way out to this, you know, port that was 30 k's out up the river called mm. Fishman's Island. They only just built. And so that the ships weren't allowed to come into the city. You know, they they used to come right into um, Newstead, which is right in the city, and then they stopped that. They made them stop out at Fisherman's Island because mm. the risk was not zero, and mm. um, but and the consequent was high. Mm. And I remember the magistrate asking me about it because he was in, you know, he wanted to know my opinion, and I got off scot free. You know, he said, "Oh, the cop stories didn't match up," so you know, <laughs> so I got off scot free that day. Classic. <laughs> 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 You know, but the truth is the truth, and I just told my truth, and it was, a, I don't know. Yes, that was the start of it, the nuclear armed warship campaigns. Yeah, All right. Yes. Well, well, that's that's a pretty, that's a, it's a really, you've, I'm glad I interviewed you, because there's a really good narrative arc to, 
to what oh, you've yeah, been up yeah. to. And where we are, you know, you wonder why I'm uh, why I'm at you know. Yeah. Because it's the same. If only we could have access to nuclear fission with our plutonium and the other shit that comes out of it. Mm. Oh, imagine it'd be so good. Yeah, but no. Mm. And and then the physicists know this. Mm. And they lie through their teeth for through, due to self interest because they can get good paying jobs because the people that you know benefit from this nuclear power, which is mostly the military, mm. because they're you know they pay well, mm. and these physicists take the coin mm. and they make the filth mm. that will be with us forever. Mm. You know, I don't have a lot of uh, time for nuclear physicists who take the coin. Mm. No, because they know better yeah. than anyone. They know better. They do. They know better than anyone how well, nasty, serious this shit really is. Well, um, gives me a lot of hope that uh, generations of kids coming out of your school are going to know as well because you've told them. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't talk <laughs> nuclear physics with them. <laughs> 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 they don't, you know, no, they don't teach enough in physics at high school to teach nuclear physics. They used to, but not anymore. Mm. Yeah, no. Um, I can't, you know, like most kids I teach don't watch the news. Mm. Don't, you know, I'm talk, talking to year seven, top year seven class, I don't know anything about Gaza. Mm. Don't know what, well, what's going on, what do you mean? Doesn't come through their feed. Mm. So, you know, on their phone. Does TikTok, is TikTok covering Gaza? You know, for well, kids and that, in the, right? and that makes it easier, right? That sort of that when we were talking about the influence of the military and how they sort of present themselves in these programs or the the weapons industry sort of presents itself, it's easier when it's detect decontextualized, right? Like yeah, when yeah, there's yeah. no mm. no well, existing sort of no, framework I, for yeah, yeah. yeah. And you do yeah, you know, if Hiroshima Day, Hiroshima Day makes it to the news, I'll be surprised. Mm. But it probably will this year, the 79th anniversary. But the kids, you know, they're not going to see it. Because mm. it's not going to be on TikTok. Mm. Yeah. So the kids don't actually get a full picture. Mm. So they don't understand what plutonium is. That's why mm. I, you know, when I do an actions now, I, I make sure I've got placards that say mention plutonium mm. because it's not mentioned in the media. Mm. Mm. Okay, got to go. Well, having dinner. all right. I won't keep you from your family dinner. Thanks so much for your time. And um, and also thanks so much for all the work you're doing, you know, both in the classroom and in the streets, rallying against uh, the intrusion of the military. Uh, as a oh, yeah. as a fellow yeah, well, physicist, I applaud your your good work. It is a constant battle to keep the military. It is, mm. yeah, away yeah, from I'm physics. Be <laughs> interesting. Mm. Yeah, no, physics should be interesting. It was just that, you know, they're not going to pay. The military pays better than teaching mm. for physicists, yeah. not for soldiers. Yeah. Mm. Wow. All right, Captain. Thanks so much, James. Have a good night. <laughs>